Hi everyone, welcome to the BioEdge. Here at the BioEdge, we've noticed something that you'll never see written in any biological textbook. And that is that no terrestrial carnivorous animal migrates in tandem with its migratory prey. And the best example of this is in the Serengeti, where wildebeest, gazelle, zebra, and eland all migrate through the ecosystem, covering hundreds of kilometers every year. But not one of the many carnivores in that ecosystem manages to do the simplest thing, which is to walk in the wake of the um, migratory prey animal and pick it off all through the year, um, particularly when uh, in the breeding season, um, there's a, 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 a large number of, of um, easily accessible babies available. In the case of the Canadian tundra, the migratory caribou of Canada outdistance the wolf and reach a place where there are no wolves and the babies can be um, born safely in a kind of a predator-free zone. Now, why is it that none of these animals, lions, cheetahs, African hunting dogs, spotted hyena, or even the Rupel's griffon vulture, which is mainly a, a fresh meat eater in the Serengeti, why is it that none of them managed to, to, to match the locomotory power of their prey and simply track them around their annual circuit? Well, the, the, um, the answer we've got from specialists in this field who've studied lions and other carnivores in places like the Serengeti is that it comes down to the breeding habits of the carnivores, all of which have a central breeding location in which they're grounded for part of the year because their babies are not very mobile. Now, it's critical to understand that even in the case of the most mobile um, carnivorous mammals like the spotted hyena and the hunting dog, the babies can't keep up with the adults in sharp contrast to animals like wildebeest and zebra in which the babies are born with long legs and great muscle power and can within days keep up with the, the migration. So that would seem to be at, at, at a kind of approximate or, or um, superficial level the reason for this disparity between the locomotory powers of the uh, prey and the locomotory powers of the predators. But it can't be that simple because if it were energetically or thermodynamically possible for the predators to uh, keep up with their, their uh, migratory prey, then they would surely have evolved precocial enough young in parallel with their prey animals, um, with the young being born long-legged and mobile and, and being able to keep up. So we think that that, that explanation um, doesn't really get at the root causes. Now, here's an, here's an alternative explanation. The difference between a wildebeest on the one hand and a lion on the other is that the wildebeest eats um, what effectively amounts to a fatty diet, whereas counterintuitively the lion has the opposite kind of diet, a diet that is remarkably, uh, you may even say desperately, poor in fat. Now that, that uh, may seem like a, a really strange claim. Let's explain a little. What a wildebeest basically eats is, is uh, cellulose in the form of, of grass fiber. But because of its rumen fermentation system in which anaerobic bacteria ferment the fiber, it winds up living mainly on fatty, what are called fatty acids. We prefer to call them fatty ions here at the uh, bioedge. But they are essentially the, the building blocks of saturated fats. And so what goes into the mitochondria of the wildebeest in order to power its migration is the same kind of substance that goes into the mitochondria of animals that eat fat. Like when you eat a nice uh, lamb chop, the, the saturated fat goes into your cells in the form of saturated fatty acids. And those are the same fatty acids, in part, uh, that the wildebeest runs on because its digestive system has managed to convert what is initially a very unpromising food, indigestible cellulosic fiber, to the best possible energy source for muscle cells, and that is saturated fatty acids. In contrast to that, look at what the, the poor lion is faced with. The lion would seem to be, you know, at the top of a food pyramid with all the power and having a kind of a luxury um, lifestyle. But the reason it's sleeping most of the day and seems so lazy and, and is unable to track its, its, uh, its prey species is that 
the wildebeest and the other herbivores are extremely lean almost all through the year. And so lions are actually faced with, an, with a severe and extreme diet um, dominated by protein with extremely little fat. And protein has to be converted into, into sugar in order to fuel the, the, the muscles of a lion. And so a lion winds up being quite a, a, an energy-deprived animal in contrast to its prey. What we're left with is, is a situation where uh, the wildebeest although ostensibly the vulnerable prey, have a superior energy source to um, their ostensibly powerful and, and superior carnivores, which, which have to make do on an inferior energy source. And because of that inevitable disparity, which, which can't really be solved by evolution, it, it's one of those thermodynamic absolutes, as it were, um, we're stuck with the situation where no carnivore is ever going to be able to do the simplest trick of following its migratory herbivores around the full annual circuit because there's this energy gulf between them. And, um, and, and so that helps to explain also why many of the wildebeest in the Serengeti wound up, uh, wind up being eaten by the most feeble of all of the carnivores, which is the, the Rupal's griffin vulture, because at least the, the vulture, although again being tied to a central breeding site, has the um, cheap locomotion based on soaring and, and gliding flight that enables it to reach uh, very far from its nesting sites each day. And so we leave you with that thought about basic um, energetics in the migratory systems of the world. And we look forward to seeing you next time at Exploring the BioEdge. Bye.